Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, whatever the case may be. Welcome back. Um, you'll see the, uh, hopefully you see the checkup, check-in uh, survey pop up. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind getting those questions answered for me, we're going to take just another minute or two and let some more folks get joined before class gets started. Um, but uh, in the meantime, uh, if you're already done with that check-in survey, we can make sure that the chat is working and that everybody has that pulled up. Um, so I'm not sure we actually did this last week that I, I get to hear about all the geography, which is one of the fun things about doing uh, remote classes. So I think I may have mentioned, but in case I didn't, that's the north side of the city of Chicago out those windows behind me. So I'm very curious to know, go ahead and drop in the chat where you are joining from today uh, while we wait for a few more of your classmates to join and then we'll dig into some logic games. Oak Park, oh, Brian, you're right down the street, so, sort of. Sunny Denver, cool. Roanoke, nice. Uh, ooh, we're, we're all over. Um, Seoul, Peter, you're in Seoul. Oh, you're going to win the prize for traveling the farthest, Peter, I think. Um, see who else we've got here. Seattle is in the house. Massachusetts, welcome. Lovely part of the country. Uh, ahoy to our Canadian friend. Hey, Kaylee, glad to have you aboard. Um, LA, of course, you get a, a group big enough. You got to have LA represented. Wicker Park, all right. Also not too far. Wicker Park, it's a little closer to me than uh, than Oak Park. I'm basically like in Lincoln Square up on the north side, a little quieter uh, in my part of town. Bloomington, Christopher, I'm imagining that's Bloomington, Indiana, uh, also not too far away. Utah is here. North Carolina is here. Mississippi's here. Seriously, I'm, I'm not keeping track, but this is a lot of states that we have covered. Uh, of course, our New Yorker folks in Short Hills, I don't know, is that North Jersey like closer to New York or South Jersey like closer to Philly? I don't know, Short Hills, uh, but glad to have you. And San Francisco. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of what I thought. I guess I just sort of always assume closer to New York City, but I don't think I actually know Short Hills. Um, all right, we're getting a little closer to our uh, perfect attendance here. Um, so I'm just going to give it one more minute, one more call out. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to fill out the check-in survey, if you can get those questions answered for me, it just helps with a little better sense of exactly who's in the room and what situations are like today. Um, and then, oh man, the fun we're going to have. I know I will sleep well tonight after a couple hours of logic games. I'll be very worn out. Um, but I'm glad to see that about half of you have said energized and ready to dig in. That's fantastic. Uh, but even if you're in that, uh, I'm going to give it my best shot, or I'm just trying to hang in there. If you're in one of those groups, hopefully that list of answers appropriately captures your feeling one way or the other. Um, I know um, one of my strengths as an instructor is I'm going to keep the energy up. We're going to power right through these games. Everybody's going to have more score, more uh, points on their logic game section score uh, by the time these next couple of hours have gone by. Um, all right. If you haven't had a chance to get to the check-in survey quite yet, I'm going to leave you in the cold, finish up so we can go ahead and get started. But this is great. Um, it looks like the bulk of folks got a chance to try the games that were included in my uh, homework assignment there. Um, the truth is, even if you didn't do the homework, it's usually just going to consist of working on some stuff from the prep tests that we're going to see in class. So it just gives you a little preview since class might move a little quickly. We're going to move basically at game day speed. It makes sure that you've seen some of this material already and you have some comparison between how you attacked it and how I'm going to demonstrate it um, as we walk through class. And sort of as I was expecting, we're all over the map in terms of what logic game scores have looked like. Even if you're in that top group saying you usually get 17 or more right already, I've got some tips probably that are gonna help you out, maybe some things you can do a little bit more effectively. But especially if you're not in that top group or you feel like the results have been really inconsistent, that's a lot of what we're focused on tonight is how to grab the points that are most grabbable and how to get a little bit more consistent by starting to recognize some of the, the patterns that show up and really know what to do with them when you see them. Um, okay, so uh, let me uh, jump on in here. Um, first, just a few 
quick reminders. Um, I'm glad to see for most folks that that chat is working. Um, but uh, feel free to use that chat. I'm going to keep that in front of my face the whole time. So especially if I go a little quickly, you need some clarification. Chat's great for that or, or any other feedback or commentary uh, that you'd like to provide for myself or your classmates. Um, you can use the Q&A if you want to ask questions anonymously, or if you think of a question that you want me to address at one of our question breaks, but that isn't about what we're talking about right at that second section, second, that's a good place to park it. Um, and I may once or twice ask to see hands raised uh, to get a little bit of quick feedback. So make sure you know where that raise hand button is should be along the bottom of the video. A uh, quick reminder also, Magoosh Live classes are a safe space. So as you know, that just means for me, I'm trying to make this as inclusive and as welcoming, as accessible as possible. So if you have feedback along those lines, we would really value it. You can call that stuff out here in class or follow up with an email after. Um, I may have slightly misspoken or given a poor impression. I know we were a little slow on the recording this week for folks who wanted to get access to that. We've figured the kink out there. So it should pretty much be 24 hours or less after class that you will be able to access both the recording and the handout, which I know I didn't do last week, will both be available from the classes tab. Um, the handout I'll go ahead and link if I remember to right after class, but definitely by tomorrow, you'll be able to get to those things for folks who wanna revisit the slides or the recording on their own schedule later. And lastly, of course, anytime you need more help, more support, or hopefully you know we're trying to get as much feedback we can about what you like and what you'd like to see changed about these classes, um, you can feel free to email help at uh, with any of that stuff. Um, next, whoop. next. Uh, just one more time, uh, pulling up the course overview, the class schedule here. This is mostly just so that I can quickly remind everybody, uh, two weeks from tonight, the 28th, we will skip and then resume with our last two sessions in January. And uh, for tonight, we know we're looking to get into logic games, a little bit of a deep dive. So basically what's going to happen is we are going to walk through pretty much completely three of the logic games is probably going to take up all the time that we've got, but we're going to go through three games that have some of the most common patterns you're going to see in them. And, and that's why I really like walking through these. It gives me a chance to dump all the really great expert tips on you and for everybody to get a chance. If you're a little newer to see the best practices demonstrated, I'll be showing it all on screen and you can more or less just follow along for folks who are already a little bit more intermediate or advanced with games or if you're not intermediate or advanced yet, but you've had a lot of practice and, and really everybody, make sure while I'm talking right now that you've got some scratch paper pulled up, especially I'm gonna be asking you to work on some questions independently again, uh, which means that uh, you're gonna wanna have your own notes uh, available to refer to when you're trying to score those points. But the basic idea here and with this whole course is to uncomplicate how we attack the logic games. So we're not gonna to be totally comprehensive. We're not gonna cover every single little thing and some of the really rare question types. We're gonna focus on what's worth the most points, what you're sure to see on test day and what everybody needs to feel like they can attack the LSAT and be in the most strategic position to do so. Um, so a lot of tips focused around identifying inferences. And then we're really gonna see how uh, finding inferences on logic games is not about a thousand different things. It's really just about one or two key things we're going to see that a lot of points come from just having that one or two, uh, those one or two inferences figured out. Um, it's going to make us all feel like experts, uh, I hope, in any case. Um, let's first just quickly recap here. This is a slide we saw last week. And we know we got a little bit of instruction on some of the basics, things that most people feel a little bit more confident getting up on their feet with, which is dealing with the master diagram that usually comes from that first paragraph uh, and diagramming out the rules using some basic symbols. So hopefully everybody's been practicing a little bit more with some of the guidance I gave last week and feeling okay about that. We will, of course, still walk through those parts on the games that we're going to look at. Um, but in order to get to a successful part four, score the points, we know we're really most concerned with what happens here in part three, this idea of what it means to work to solve, what it means to make inferences, and to draw limited options as the best way to put yourself in position to score all the points, right? Um, so this third part, this work to solve, 
of course, the first most important thing to know, uh, again, is fools rush in. If you heard me say that last week, um, the whole idea here is the main thing that makes you good at logic games is not right there on the page. You're not responding to the text itself or doing the heavy lifting, working on the questions, but there is a pause that happens so that we can draw out a little bit more than just what we're explicitly told. It's really where the lawyering skills come into the logic games. You get through your master diagram and the list of rules, and then you're gonna take a couple minutes and say, what else can I unpack here? What else do I know for sure? What's possible, what's not possible? And by doing that upfront, you're gonna be in a lot more command to go to questions and say, oh, I actually already had all these answers sketched out. And you can get down to really only 10 or 20 seconds per question versus 60 to 90 seconds or more needing to do a lot of the heavy lifting on the questions themselves, which tends not to be as good a balance of time. And it tends to make you a less confident test taker. You're gonna be going on hunches. And we really wanna treat logic games like math. Like we're gonna prove it and be sure that we're picking right answers each time that we move on. So before we dive into the first game that we're gonna work on together, I just wanna point out a lot of what we're gonna see here tonight and what you really need to know about when we say make inferences, it's not this wide open world of, you know, you should be so brilliantly clever and just come up with something. And especially by test day, it should feel like almost all the inferences you're gonna make are just a new version of an inference that you've actually made before because you've seen these same patterns so many times. So definitely these first two that come up all the time, I would say are the two most common patterns that lead directly to how we're gonna make inferences and think about limited options in the game is finding out that there's a letter in our list that can only go in two spaces. And so we're gonna have two pretty clear options for a game or a little less likely, but still sometimes worth thinking about is a space that gets limited to only two letters that will fit there. And then of course the pairs of letters that have to go together. Um, those pairs or those blocks of letters um, are a huge key to seeing that a game only has limited options to work through. We're going to get into that a little bit more in just a few minutes. If those two things aren't present on a game, then what we are very often looking for is rules that are going to reuse a letter. In other words, some letter, one of the items in your list, is more impacted, more restricted by the rules than the others. And that's where some limited options are gonna come from. There's only gonna be a couple of ways, usually two or three, uh, to handle that letter such that it, it follows the rules. And then if you're, it feels a little more wide open or you're a bit more of a loss, you should be looking for that strictest rule. What's the rule that seems like it has the biggest impact on the game? And very often for pattern recognition sake, that means you're gonna see the word must or exactly appear in a rule. A little less common, but another good thing to be thinking about, especially as you're still getting used to this. Uh, where are my inferences, my limited options gonna come from? Well, must or exactly are the kinds of words that add a lot more restrictions uh, to the logic of the game. Okay. Uh, here's my chance one more time to get us all psyched up. We'll all, all get used to this part before we jump into our first game. Can you let me know in the chat that you are RTG ready to go? And we'll start diagramming and having some fun. There it is. All right. Everybody's feeling good or at least good enough is all I ask on a Tuesday. Okay, here we go. So we're gonna start with, this is game two from prep test 72. And we'll walk through all the diagramming here together. And then I'll give a few minutes for everybody to try the questions again, or possibly for the first time, once you see uh, what I think is really probably the expert way to walk through this thing. So here we go, pencils are all ready. And it says on a single day, a realtor is going to show a client five houses, exactly one in each of five neighborhoods. Make sure I got my pen ready. This is Q, R, S, T, and V. Get that out of the way. So we know we're going to make the list of letters. It says each house will be shown to the client exactly once. And the order in which they're shown is subject to these rules. So the order, if you didn't know before, makes it pretty clear. I'm going to stick this up here that we're just gonna take these five letters and put it into a single row of five spaces. So one more quick check 
on part one, dealing with the first paragraph of the master diagram, we said it always has these three parts, right? And here we go, you know, you feel good about your master diagram when you've got that list of letters. Sometimes I'll call that our inventory, the empty spaces where we're gonna arrange those letters. And of course, labels uh, for those spaces, in this case, just one, two, three, four, five. That means we're ready to go to the rules. First rule says R is gonna be either first or second. So I start making my little numbered list of the rules there. That's the, my convention. I recommend to you to stay super organized, but this is a rule that can be shown right in the master diagram. So remember the tip from last week, if you can put the rule directly into the master diagram, that is always preferable. And what you'll see me do, even if it's probably different from most other instructors, but so helpful from years of LSAT tutoring, I know so helpful that I, I don't need to write anything else separately for that rule. I can just check it off. And now my visual aid later, if I scan through that list of rules, the check mark tells me as long as I'm following my master diagram, this rule is already taken care of. And there it is. We know the slash is what we use for or something that has two options. Or you might hear me say a 50-50 that R is either going to go one or two. And you might be used to seeing like R slash X or something indicating that it's either R or it's X. But you want to get very used to seeing R slash empty. What we're going to use that to mean is there may be more than two options for space one or for space two, but R slash empty indicates to me that there are only two spots where R can go. And that's especially helpful here. They're right next to each other. You might not lose track of it. It's space one or space two. But if you had a longer list where your two R's were separated a little more, that slash empty is a helpful reminder. If R does not go into one of those spaces, it's going to be forced into its other space, right? Quick little inference there that, of course, we'll be making in just a second, especially because R is going to have to share space one since rule number two says T either goes first or fifth. So everybody along with me, we all know how to handle this one. I'm gonna do T again, slash empty on space one and T slash empty on space five. So be very clear. It's not only R or T that could go to space one. It could be something else, Q or S or V as far as we know right now. So that's why it's still important to have that R slash T slash empty. So I don't get myself thinking if it's not R, it has to be T or vice versa. That is not the case. Okay, we can check that off in the list here. Rule number three says the third house is going to be either Q or V. Hopefully everybody's feeling really good about this one too. Again, right in the master diagram, Q slash V onto space three. And one more time, I can check that off. Ooh, that's showing up. There it is in my list of rules. And the last rule says Q cannot be either immediately before or immediately after S. So that's just a wordy way for them to say they can't be next to each other, right? They're gonna have to be split up. So that's where we'll show what we would usually do when a pair of letters has to go together, Q and S in a circle. I hope you guys are feeling good. You folks, I should say, are feeling good about that Q and S in the circle tells us they go together in either order. Doesn't matter Q, S, S, Q, they just have to be together. But in this case, not, right? I'm gonna put the slash through it to tell us they have to get separated. You should feel pretty confident that any rule that tells you letters have to get separated will not be able to go right in the master diagram. There's gonna be a bunch of ways to split Q and S up. So that one definitely gets written off to the side for now. All right, if we're feeling good, about the list of rules, then we're ready to move into the make inferences and draw some limited options. We love this game in particular. This is why part of the reason it's the first one we lead off with here, because the game handed us uh, letters that can only go in two spaces, right? So you saw me bring up a second ago, that's probably the most common pattern for how you'll know to get your limited options set up. R only has two places it can go. T only has two places it can go. And one of those overlaps, right? They, obviously, they can't both go to space one at the same time. So what we're going to say to ourselves is there are three good options there. And I'm going to try my best to line this up so that I don't have to make a lot more mess writing in one, two, three, four, five again. But keep in mind, add labels anywhere you're not sure you'll be able to trust your eyes. 
Here I can sort of see I've got now a column for one, two, three, four, five. So it's lined up nicely. If you can do that in your notes, you're, you can probably get away with not labeling your options. Um, but otherwise, use labels as much as you need. Even if you just write in like two and four or just three in the middle, something. Don't trust that you're always going to count it out correctly uh, with no numbers there. Anything you can do to eliminate the risk of mistakes is, is worth doing. Okay, so why three options? Well, because we know that it could be R that goes first. And of course, if R goes first, T is going to get forced to go fifth, since that's the only other spot it's allowed. It could be that T goes first. And that means R is going to get forced into space number two. Or remember that slash empty. It could be that they both go to their alternate spots. So space one will leave empty for one of the other letters in a situation where R would go two and T would go five, okay? So nice thing about this is we've already got two out of five letters filled in. We already have two out of the four rules completely taken care of. So that's a good sign. We bit off a nice chunk of filling out the list already. And that's a good indication that this is a really great way to set up the options. Quick call out though. A lot of these games, there is more than one terrific way to do this. So if on your own, or if just now you were thinking, I want to do one where Q goes third and one where V goes third, we had another good 50-50 shot there. That would also work for, for this game. That turns out to work pretty well. You should end up in basically the same situation with all the same information in front of you a couple minutes from now. The reason I do it this way is because it's just more consistent that the limitations on letters, in other words, that R and T could only go to two spaces, is usually more helpful than the space that's limited to only two letters. Because uh, honestly, if you place Q or V next, you won't necessarily know anything other than if V goes, excuse me, if Q goes third, that S can't touch it. S can't be in the two spots next to it. So it's usually a little less helpful, but if you did it that way, there's actually no sweat here. That's a great way to do this particular game, but I think uh, this should be uh, plan A on a game like this for these particular options. Okay, so assuming that we've worked through this fairly quickly, we've still got a couple minutes to deal with making some inferences. So we know we've taken care of rule number one and rule number two. Those are unbreakable now if we follow these options. But we do want to recheck rules number three and four for more inferences. We'll see if we can fill in. So we're going to check each of those two rules against each of these three options. And we're, we'll find out we're going to be able to get a lot more filled in here. OK, so follow along with me or call it out in the chat. If I say something that doesn't make sense here, make sure you're on my same page. Let's look at that first option where R and T are on the ends. And we're thinking now about rule number three. Is it going to be Q or V that goes third, or could it be either one? And hopefully you're already thinking, or you certainly will agree with me once I say, if I now put Q into space three, it's going to be next to the only two spaces left, which means we're going to have no choice but to put S next to Q, and that's going to break rule four. So in this first option, we will have to put V into space number three. And that way we can now split Q and S up with the two spaces that are left. You could just leave them, but it's gonna be a lot more complete and go faster later to just go ahead and put Q slash S in on space two and on space four. And we love it. Everything's basically filled in except for a couple slashes. That first option, more inferences pretty much figured out. Let's go to option number two, where we start with T and R. And now we'll find ourselves in the exact opposite situation, where if I now put V onto space three, Q and S will be forced into those last two spaces that, again, are next to one another. So that would break rule four. So now, in order to keep Q and S separate, I will have to put Q into space number three. And now the rest of this is figured out, right? S will have to go over here to be away from Q. And that leaves only one space for V to go into. We love this. This is totally figured out. No options left. We're feeling really good about that, I hope. All right. Our third option, where R is second, T is fifth, and that first space is still open. I'm now thinking if I put Q third, I'll still be able to put S over in space number one. 
And if I put V third, the two spaces left aren't next to one another. So in this case, it actually looks like space three could be Q or V. So you could just write Q slash V into space three and move along your merry way. But given that this will only take a few extra seconds, I actually wanna show both because I know I can suss out just a little bit more information and really be uh, in a position to slam dunk the questions. So I'm gonna make a second copy again of the same option where R goes in space two and T goes in space five. And we'll do one where Q goes third and we'll do one where V goes third. And now in both cases, we know what's up with those last two spaces. In that third option, S will have to go over here so that it's away from Q, right? Not allowed to be together. One space left to put V into. And in our last option, doesn't matter. Q, S, S, Q, right? Either way, they're separated. We're following all the other rules. So as we did before, I'll go ahead and put Q slash S into each of the two remaining spaces. Everybody feeling good that they know how we got here, know what wants to happen next. Okay, so if you already have it pulled up, Law Hub or whatever, that's great. Otherwise, I'm just gonna drop a link here and I want everybody to get a little bit more practice. So if you remember the answers, cause like you just did this earlier today or yesterday, or earlier in the week or whatever, we still want, we want the repetition. We want the practice using the options, okay? So I'm gonna give everybody just like four minutes will take to revisit the questions. So make sure your notes are caught up and that you're not just relying on my slide. We'll all get a chance to score the points using what is basically a handy little solution to the game that we have sitting right in front of us. And then we'll review the right answers together. All right, just about four minutes from now.
About another 30 seconds. All right, let's see uh, what we can do. So I'm just uh, getting the, the screen share uh, switched around here so we can all see the questions together. Uh, hopefully this is working, but shout it out in the chat if it's not, uh, but I think I have this worked out okay. Um, so uh, if you are looking at the same notes that I am, the same options I am, then most of these questions turn out to be kind of a slam dunk. And we really see the value of having it solved out a little bit ahead of time. Uh, so question number one here says, uh, if the house in Q is shown forth, which of the following must be true? So what we wanna do is we're checking the options and on a must be true question, it means something's forced into place. We're already showing something in any situation where Q goes forth, which as we scan through our options, we see we have twice our, though at least the way I listed it out, our first option and our last option both had Q slash S on space four. So the best idea is if you can visualize in this case that we are now slamming Q into space four, S goes into the other space it's allowed to go. Um, if you're not able to do that, then you just quickly sketch out extra copies and, and place things where you need to, to have a, a little better visual aid, only a few extra seconds. But what we should be able to see is in both of these cases, so that there's a couple ways this could go, let me first say. The first way for it to go is to say, in both scenarios where Q could go forth, I see that there are two things that are true both times, in both that first option and that fourth option, it, where Q could go fourth, V has to go third and T has to go fifth. So knowing those two things are already forced in place, that means those two things fit really well, a must be true answer. And we could start scanning the list and say, oh, here, there it is, V goes third, right? What may be more likely for some folks, and this will definitely happen if you don't have all the options already spelled out, is you're gonna need to go through a little bit of process of elimination and say, if I can disprove, if I'm showing the opposite of what is in an answer choice, that means that answer choice does not fit a must be true answer and I can eliminate that choice. So for instance, in option number four, Q could go fourth, but R is not first. So I would be able to eliminate it. In our first option where Q could go first, R is not second. Again, the opposite is shown and that means I can eliminate that answer. We also see uh, in our last option there, the second uh, option where Q could go fourth, S is not second. I can eliminate that. And in all these options where Q goes fourth, we saw T had to be fifth. It's never first. So you could do this by process of elimination also, but one way or the other, we all want to agree. Answer choice E is correct uh, to this first question. All right, and jump in uh, if there are uh, questions, you get a little bit confused here. Otherwise we'll go to the next one, which says the order in which the houses are shown is fully determined if which one of the following is true. So you won't always have this question on every game. This is a little different. We know that the overwhelming majority of your uh, questions, in fact, like close to 90% of them are gonna say which of the following is true if something else, or they'll just say which of the following could be, must be, cannot be true without any new if condition. Now we're turning that around. We're saying if we add the condition that the answer choice is true, 
We're now saying fully determined. Would it be fully determined? What they mean by that is there's now one and only one option. And not only just one of our four options, but no slashes, no empty spaces, no choices left to make. There's only one arrangement of the list that contains one of these answers. For the four wrong answers, there are multiple arrangements of the list that would still be allowed and follow all the rules. Uh, and therefore we can eliminate them, which is probably what you should expect that again, this is gonna be process of elimination. So looking at our uh, options here, we saw from on my list, it was the middle two, but we had two different options where Q is third. That tells us it's not fully determined, two different options, right? Not fully determined. Uh, so we can eliminate that one. We do only have the one option out of the four we drew where R goes first. But within that option, we didn't know whether Q goes two and S goes four or the other way around. There's still a slash in there, right? Still a choice that we could make, which means it's almost but not quite fully determined if R goes first. So we can eliminate that one as well. We do see though, three of our four options R went second. We only have that first one where S could go second. And if we put S second, Q gets forced into the fourth spot. There's no other slashes, no other empty spaces. That is fully determined. So if you're feeling pretty confident on test day, you're gonna choose C and move on. Otherwise, we could also quickly double check here. T is not, or excuse me, T is fifth in more than one option. So that's not fully determined. I can eliminate that. And V is fourth in more than one option. That does not fully determine it. That one's also eliminated. So again, one way or the other, we should all agree. Answer choice C is correct. All right, let's go to the next one. No if condition this time. So sometimes these are a little bit more time consuming, especially when you don't have the options drawn out. This is gonna be a slam dunk for us though. Which of the following could be true? So just remember on a could be true question, we're saying one right answer is possible. It fits, the first one we find that fits any of these options, we can pick if we can trust our work on test day. Otherwise we'll eliminate the ones that we know are impossible uh, if we need to use process of elimination to fall back on one right answer. And in this case, they help us out a little bit because we see only one option where Q is allowed to go first is Q slash S on the first space in our fourth option. So we see that is allowed. If you're a little disconcerted, I don't want you wasting time this on test day. Just because you think you might be getting tricked is not a good reason to invest more time here. So you should feel pretty confident picking A and moving on but especially for due diligence in class, just to show that we have no options where Q goes fifth, that's impossible. V never goes first, that's eliminated. V never goes second, also impossible and eliminated. And V never goes fifth, it always went third or fourth. So that's also eliminated. Answer choice A definitely gets you the point here. All right, if there are no questions there, let's go to number four here. It says, if S is earlier than Q, which of the following must be true? So this one might be a little bit trickier since we do have one option where we definitely had S before Q, the one where S is first and Q went third. But we also have those other options with Q slash S in both of those options, S could go before Q. So it's actually three out of the four here that could follow this rule. So you may find yourself on questions like that, making extra copies of your diagram to show specifically S going before Q and visualize that more clearly. Otherwise, let's remember on must be true, we're gonna look at these three options that all are the ones where S could go before Q and say, what do they have in common? What's already shown in each of those options and hopefully be able to scan through the list, match what we see is already shown to one of these answers and know that it's correct. So in all three, where S could go before Q, what do we see? We see T at the end. The only one where T is not fifth is has S last, right? S is not before Q. So in all three options where S goes before Q, T goes fifth. And on test day, we wanna uh, congratulate ourselves for doing such great work on these options. Clearly proves that answer choice D is correct. All right, one more here. 
It says if the house in V is third, which of the following must be true? So this is good. We're getting some good reps on this same idea here. Must be true says we're looking back at our options. We have two of them where V went third. So two of them fit the condition given in this question. And we're looking for what those two have in common. And this is where I can start to really hammer home to you folks. The same inferences score you more than one point because the ones where V goes third are the same ones where S goes before Q, right? We're looking at two of the same three we were just looking at. So again, we know that T must go fifth. And again, thank you LSAT, that is on the list of answers. So we can feel pretty confident that answer choice E must be correct. Again, T is fifth is the right answer. And what do you know? A hundred percent correct. Good for us. Um, as I uh, shift my screen share back here, give just one more chance in case I did say anything terribly confusing. Feel free to uh, shoot me any questions. Move my face out of the way. Uh, one of my face is enough. I <laughs> probably don't need to. Okay. Um, so what are we learning here? A lot of, lot of text on this slide, but let me make sure we can hit a few really good takeaways. And I'll remind you again, you'll have the link to the slides. You'll have the recording to revisit some of this if you're not capturing it all right now. But that first bullet pointed list is really what's most important on this slide. What we were, we were able to identify limited options pretty quickly, pretty directly once we had worked through the rules. On this game, that's because they hand fed us rules that said there were letters that could only go in two spaces. So again, that's a great way to set up your options. So one quick reminder, it'll be the same process every time that hopefully you're going through a lot and that you're, you're gonna need a lot of practice with. I was not born an expert in this either. It took some time to get as good at this as I now am. So don't get discouraged. You gotta be willing to practice some to say, okay, once I know what my options are, we made new copies of the master diagram to show those different options. In this case, those were the different configurations of R and T. Then we rechecked our leftover rules, the ones about Q and V and splitting Q and S up. And that turned out that we had more inferences, more that we could add as we went through one option at a time. And we basically had the game solved. We had every allowable arrangement of the game represented in our visual aid. That's what made the questions a real slam dunk, right? So now different instructors may tell this to you differently and different people based on how our brains are wired, based on skill with logic games may do this a little differently. There will be times where games are a little bit more open or you're not able to see the options as clearly and you'll need to move on without having that complete solution in front of you. But especially, especially, if you're aiming for a higher end score, if you think you're going to score 90th percentile, like low to mid 160s or higher, or if you feel like games is your strong suit, you need games to help you make up points that you might not get on logical reasoning or reading comp, you really need to practice this and feel like almost every game, for sure three out of four on your test day, you will have these options pretty much filled out, basically have that solution or that key to the game already filled out within that five, six minute time frame before you start working on the questions. This is logic games at its highest level. This is how the top experts are doing it. And that should be the ideal type that everybody's shooting for. If you're planning on, eh, you know, sort of a medium logic game score, getting a little better than 50-50 would be okay. Then at least one or two of the games you're doing this and you'll feel okay about leaving a couple of the others more open and leaving more of the work on the questions, okay? If you don't have options drawn out, that's what's going to happen. Um, you're not going to have as slam dunk straight path to the answers as we've just had. So you should expect, and you may have seen this tip out there. I think it comes up in Magoosh lessons, but it definitely comes up throughout LSAT world that you should work on questions that start with if first. Okay. Again, if you have the, the options all drawn out, it doesn't matter what order you do the questions in. They're all going to be a lot easier. It doesn't matter. But if you don't have the options drawn out, if you did leave it more open going into the questions, then you want to go out of order and start with the questions that started with if, the ones that introduce a new condition, a new rule, which uh, the lingo there is local questions. Sometimes you'll hear those referred to as local questions. Um, 
because basically you're going to end up making a copy of your diagram to show that new rule. And then that new copy of your diagram, you're probably going to be able to reuse on other questions. I think we'll see that in the other games we'll try tonight. So that's why that tip is so valuable. You're going to have extra work done that you can leverage on the, as we call them, global questions, the ones that don't start with if, basically. And let's remember that on could be true questions, you're going to need to make a copy to show what's in an answer choice, show that it's possible, that it works. That's what could be true means. And you can choose the first one that works, that you know you filled out that option entirely uh, following all the rules. That means that's a right answer on could be true and you can move on. Must be true is a little trickier, let's remember. And really, um, the thing to remember on must be true is you want to disprove, okay? So it, what that means here is you are going to make a copy of the diagram, but you want to show the opposite of the answer choice. So if the answer choice says Q goes third, you want to put Q anywhere but the third space. You want to put it two or four or somewhere else. And again, if you can fill that diagram then all the way out, not showing what's in the answer and follow all the rules, then you know that you can eliminate that answer because it doesn't fit must be true. You did it without following that. So it, it, it doesn't have to be true. It does not fit must be true. Hopefully one way I'm saying this is landing. Sometimes the, the articulating this can get a little murky, but I think you know what I mean, or I will uh, trust you to ask. Uh, if you don't, uh, feel free to let me know. All right, are we feeling good? Um, the timing is a little funny. We got two more games we want to get through, but I still think it's the best idea if we're able to grab a little break. So we're, we're close enough to the middle of class that what I'd like to do is take, again, just a tight five here. So I have just about 10 to the hour. So at five to the hour, at 55 past, we will come back, we'll jump into our second game, but we'll take a just quick five minute break. And then we're going to have a lot more fun uh, in part two. All right, see you in five.
All right, let's rally on back. The fun has only just begun. Um, I, I'm trying, I'm trying to try to make this interesting if I can. Um, partly to let me know you're back in front of the screen, partly just to keep the energy up. Uh, one more time, are we ready for round two? How about that? RTG, you're ready to go for round two in the chat. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right, all my future lawyers, let's get into our second go here. Um, and we're looking at uh, the first game from Prep Test 71. <clears throat> and it goes a little something like, a movie studio is scheduling the release of six films. It's F G H J K L. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, no two of these films can be released on the same date. It, usually there's more text than that, but they're expecting just from that that you understand, okay, can't be released on the same date. We are putting them in order. Of course, if you were unsure about that, once you get to the rules that say earlier than this, later than that, uh, that's a really good indicator that sequencing or ordering is what's happening here. So again, we got our list of letters, we've got empty spaces, we have labels for those spaces. And that makes a good master diagram. Um, let's go to the rules. First rule says, and I, I know we're, we're revisiting this, I used these as examples of, of rules and master diagram last night. So hopefully everybody feels good about this part. Uh, but that first rule says, F goes uh, earlier than J and L. So I think it's most common to use the dashes. You'll see people do dot, dot, dot. Just don't have them floating in space. Have something that indicates this before and after relationship. So we use dashes for that as well. And let's remember, this rule doesn't tell us anything about the order of J and L. That could go either way. So I like stacking those vertically as a good visual reminder. All I know from this rule is F goes before both of them. Second rule says K goes before J and J goes before H. So hopefully at this point, everybody's on board. A rule like that feels like one of the easier parts of this. And mercifully, only three rules. The last one says L goes earlier than G. So I think we will all agree about getting these rules diagrammed. And now we're going to get to some inferences. And really important for me to point out Inferences on the LSAT mostly are not happening when you're mm, thinking about it and staring up at the screen. Inferences are going to be happening as you're writing and diagramming more. So we know most of the games, about two thirds historically, are these sequencing games. And most of those sequencing games, the rules sound like these, where this goes before that, this goes after that, right? It's a little less common that there's only sequencing rules, but that's part of what makes this one a good example to teach. Um, but the point is, if you have a game that's got more than one rule with sequencing in it, which there's at least a 50-50 shot, you're going to see one like that on test day and maybe more than one, then what we are looking for, again, back at our common patterns for where inferences come from, is rules that reuse letters. So we see here J comes up in more than one of the rules, and L comes up in more than one of the rules, and that means we want to combine the rules together. So what I'm now going to do is go to a brilliant next step of making inferences of rewriting the rules, except I'm only going to use each letter once. So they all get combined together into one brilliantly inferential sort of a schematic that will represent this whole game. Okay. So kind of like this. So here's that first rule F goes before J and L. But now using that same J, I'm going to show rule number two, K goes before J H comes after J, and I'm going to use that same L to show L has to go before G, our third rule. And typically speaking in my notes, as I will do here, I'm going to box that up to sort of set it apart visually from the list of rules. I basically don't need to look at the list of rules anymore. This does capture all the rules. And because we've combined them together, we actually now have more relationships than we saw in the list of rules. So believe it or not, we just made most of the inferences that we need to answer the questions, okay? So 
couple different ways it could go from here. I have certainly taught students in my time who really love this kind of, I'm going to keep calling this a schematic or the branches or whatever. I try to stay away from lingo. That's the best word I can think of of what's happening in the box there that captures the inferences. I know there are students who think this is a really super powerful visual aid and they're just going to go from here right to the questions. I don't totally rec recommend that though. So again, as we learned last week, experiment with different approaches, figure out what works best for you. Uh, but if we get rules like this, if we combine sequencing rules in this way, we want to move on to another piece of making inferences. And the reason is we don't really know anything about one, two, three, four, five, six. We only know relative info of what goes before and after each other based on all these dashes in my box there. So what's going to happen next might be a little time consuming at first, but we're gonna practice this enough to make it go really fast. So what's gonna happen is using the info in the box, I'm gonna figure out the spaces one, two, three, four, five, six, where letters will not fit. And we're gonna go one by one through our list. This is why writing out the list of letters is helpful because we'll make sure we don't miss anything. We're gonna go alphabetically through the list here to say which spaces letters will not fit in based on knowing that letters have to come before or after them. Okay, so if it's not making sense yet, that's okay. It's gonna make sense in these next two minutes as we go through this here. So I'm gonna start with F is the first one in the list. And what I see looking in the box is that F has to have J and L after it, but by extension, F is also gonna to have to have H after it, and it's gonna to have to have G after it. So what I see here is four letters that have to come after F. And this could take a few repeats to master, but if there are four letters that have to come after F, that means there are four spaces from the back. Okay, so I start from the end there, four spaces where F will not fit. So I'm crossing off beneath my master diagram, the spaces where these letters will not go. Okay, so now either if you're still new to this, follow along with me as I go through. If you already knew this was coming, then maybe you can get ahead of me. Start knocking this out in your own notes as we go through the rest of the list here. We'll go to G next. And we see G is on its own branch. It's unconnected to the KJH branch. So make sure you know it's not a whole flow here. It's only directly reading the dashes left and right that we see G has L before it. And by extension, F has to be before it also. So two letters that have to go before G, that means there's two spaces at the front where G will not fit, okay? Can't go one, can't go two, because there wouldn't be room for F or L before it. I hope that's all clicking. Next, we'll go to H. H has J before it, but by extension, it also has K and F in front of it as well. So three letters that have to go before H, means three spaces, again, at the front. Is this working here? Is this, did this just time out on me? Where H will not fit. There goes that. Uh, I think, it, I think it, it always got to have a little bit of fun. So I think my screen froze there. So bear with me just one sec while I get that restarted for us. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay. Oh, and it kept my writing too. Isn't that nice? Okay. So uh, get, let me know in the chat if this isn't working, but I think, I think we're back. Um, and let me get rid of some of this ugliness. I can make it prettier than that. All right. So one more time, there were three letters that had to go before H. So this is three spaces at the front where H will not fit. Next, we'll go to J. J is the first one we're looking at that's sandwiched in between other letters. So we see J has one that has to follow it. So there's one space at the back where J won't fit, two that have to come before it. So two spaces at the front where J will not fit. Next, we'll go to K. K, again, totally unconnected to F and that LG branch. 
but we do see it has to have J and by extension, it has to have H that come after it. So two letters after it means two spaces at the back where K will not fit. And lastly, we have L, which we see has to come after F, but before G, one before, one after. So one space at the front, one space at the back where L will not fit. Okay, so I get asked all the time, isn't that gonna take too long? The answer is definitely no, if again, you're willing to put in a little bit of practice. The truth is you could roll me out of bed at 3 a.m. this morning and I will knock this out for you in 30 seconds because it's always the same procedure. The number that have to follow it is the number of spaces at the end you're crossing out. The number that have to go before it is the number of spaces at the front you're crossing out. And if that starts to feel mechanical, then this is honestly only about 30 to 40 seconds of work. Okay, really, really worth doing because now we've really made all the inferences. We know what will fit in each space, uh, barring any additional conditions that'll be added in by the rules. Okay, so in this game, we're gonna get a chance to see an alternative. All right, so actually first, let me call out. I could go to limited options from here. Um, and let's see how that might work. Uh, first of all, even before we think about limited options, you got to be thinking at least a little bit about numbers, right? It's not a math test, but you do want to be aware there are six total letters in the game. We've now crossed four of them off that can't go to space one and that can't go to space six. So you probably do want to add in here, we can see that it's only F or K that will fit in this first space. And it's only G or H that will fit in the last space. So that's probably worth having spelled out. Again, some overlap in the inferences here. You may be thinking, oh, but I could tell from what's in the box, K and F were the only ones that didn't have dashes sticking out the left. So I knew those were the only two that could go first. And same thing, G and H were the only two that didn't have dashes sticking out the right. So I knew those were the two that were allowed to go last. So a little overlap in the logic here but still really, really worth doing to see every one of those crossouts is another inference that we've made. So now from here, you could do limited options. You could say, I wanna do one where F goes first and one where K goes first, or the same thing, one where G goes last, one where H goes last, or even four with an F first, G last, F first, H last, K first, H last, K first. Like you can tell, I'm, I'm not, I don't want you to get into that on this game. The main reason, again, is to come back to the restriction on letters is usually more powerful than the restriction on spaces. So knowing that there's only two that can go in space one or two that can go in space six, and that definitely turns out to be true in this game, less powerful. There's going to be less extra inferences to fill in if you pursue that. So if we were, we could do some limited options. And in fact, if I were going to do that on this game... I want to say the letter that is most restricted, like which is the one that seemed most impacted. And it feels like J that was in more than one rule that's going to go somewhere in the middle and be connected both to what goes before and after. I might say J can only go three, four, or five. So this, if I were going to pursue limited options, that's probably where I would go with it. Because you can see there's now some extra inferences we could make. For instance, if J goes third, K and F have to be the first two, could be in either order. So I'd put a circle around that. If J has to go fifth, then uh, H has to be the one that goes after, right? There's gonna be more to fill in. But in this case, I'm actually gonna leave that. If you pursued that the first time you tried it or that feels better to you to do, go for it. But two notes, the, the reason why I would choose to go to the questions without mapping out limited options here is, number one, we've already done a lot of work which means that we've probably spent the time that we have. We probably sort of need to get to the questions based on the clock instead of continuing to spell out uh, limitations in the game. But more importantly, we've already made so many inferences. We know our schematic in the box has inferences. We know all those letters crossed out under the spaces represent inferences. So you probably wanna feel confident by, by test day for sure. I probably have all the inferences that lead to points already in front of my face without going to this full filling out the options bit, um, even if you're doing okay on time. So we're gonna do the other option this time where we'll be focused more on all of the info that we were able to add to the master diagram and we will rely on that to get us through the questions. Um, so again, I'm gonna give everybody just about four or five minutes. I'll send you a link to 
get to the questions again here in Magoosh. And let's confirm that we can use this visual aid, use this really awesome diagram to get the points a little bit more easily. And then we'll review all the answers together again, just about four or or five minutes from now. about 30 more seconds. All right, um, again, let me know, sort of pioneering a new screen switching thing here that I think is more helpful. So let me know again if you're not seeing what you think you're supposed to be seeing, but hopefully everybody's looking at the questions 
now because everybody's got the brilliant diagram in their own notes. Um, and let's see one more time how hopefully this work that we've done makes the questions a lot easier to tackle, a lot more confidence about scoring the points. So the first one here says, which of the following cannot be true? And uh, because there's no if condition and because cannot be, it's still, keep in mind, cannot be and must be same logic. It's basically that it must be false, um, but that there's really no two ways about it here. That means very often you're relying on process of elimination. However, you can see now why I recommend all that crossing off of letters beneath the spaces in the master diagram, because we've made so many inferences about what cannot be, what's not allowed to go in a certain space. And that's what's in all these answers, a certain letter going to a, a certain number. So what you want to do is trust the inferences I've made probably have the answer that they're looking for here because we crossed off so much stuff. So before I start making extra copies of the diagram or working through process of elimination, I want to scan and see, does one of these answers match one of those crossed off letters that we already have? Okay. And if we do that scanning through, we're going to see, hopefully everybody has it in their notes as well. We have already said K cannot fit in the fifth space. We have K crossed out beneath space five. None of, no trick questions on the LSAT, right? None of these other four correspond to letters that we already had crossed off beneath a space. So this is what I mean about taking 10 seconds on a question because we've basically already solved out the game. We've proven already answer choice E is correct here. For feeling good about that, let's go to the next one, which similar but now must be true, right? So now for must be true, we're looking for something that's already been forced into place. And without options drawn out, what I would say is that's very likely to come from that schematic, that little branchy tree thing that we made. And so once again, on must be true, I want to say I've probably already made the inference. I'm probably already showing what's forced into place in a way that matches one of these answers. So before I get started making extra copies of the diagram and working through process of elimination, we're going to scan and check to see if work that we've done uh, matches anything that we've had have here. And what do you know, we're already showing F has to go before J and J has to go before H. Therefore, it must be that F goes before H. And again, that schematic in the box there proves to us that answer choice A is correct. Woohoo, points for us. All right, let's keep going. Number three says now we've got a, an extra condition. If G is earlier than H, each of the following could be true except. So they got different ways to word the same sort of question. Could be true except is also the same as saying one of these must be false, okay? In other words, let's. I, I like to use possible and impossible. And believe me, I do this when I try a new logic game section and the clock is ticking, I still do this to make sure I don't get confused. So what that means is, the four wrong answers could be true. That means the four wrong answers are possible. They would fit into the diagramming we've done. But one of these answers is going to be impossible based either on the work we've done, or in this case, you might need a little extra work since we're adding in this new condition that G goes before H. What I want to encourage before you get started making lots of extra copies of the diagram, though, is that uh, when they give us that new condition, that's an opportunity again for you to be a lawyer and say, all right, if G goes before H, what's something new that I learn or some new inference I might be able to make? You don't wanna waste your youth thinking about that, but you're at least gonna take a beat to consider. And hopefully this is gonna make sense that if G goes before H, well, those are the two letters that we had as options for space six, right? We said G slash H on the last space. So if G goes before H, what that should tell all of us is H is the one that has to go last and G will have to come before it, right? So that part, I hopefully everyone is on board. 
And then what you may be able to just visualize, what you might need a little bit more note taking to figure out for sure is if G does not go last, that means that the letters that have to go before G all would have to go a space earlier. Since G can't be at the end anymore, G, the latest G can go is now five. That means for F and L, the two letters that have to go before G, they now have to go a little bit earlier. In other words, if G now goes before H, um, we can see that, okay, uh, L, let's, let's scan here, F and L, as I'm saying, are now the two letters that can't go as late as they could have before, right? If G has to go a little earlier, once again, the letters before G, F and L, will have to go a space earlier. So this may take a little bit of uh, working through process of elimination, but what we're gonna see is if I were to put L into space five is why I'm jumping to L in this list to F and L are the ones that are impacted since they're the ones that have to go, come before G, okay? So a little trickier, but if L goes five, we know that H is the one that goes sixth. There's now no room for L to be ahead of G. So that should tell us that answer choice E is impossible. In other words, it fits, fits that must be false, or this could be true, except. And without going through all the labor of demonstrating that the other four answers could be true with the clock ticking on test day, we want to feel pretty confident that answer choice E is correct. And if you all are on board there, again, let, let me know if not. I'm happy to stop for questions before we go to the next. But one more question here that says, if L comes before K, which of the following could be true? Now, what I would probably recommend in your notes is recopying out our little schematic where now the K and then the, by extension, the JH, that KJH branch now is sticking out from the right of L. Right. In other words, if L has to come before K, and we know that K has to come before J and H, we've now got alphabet soup here, but we now have K plus J and H plus we already knew G that have to come after L. All right. So this is now four letters that will have to follow L, which means that we know three, four, five, six, four spaces at the back where L will not fit. All right. So that that means. L going third or fourth is definitely now impossible. There have to be four spaces after L for all that other, all those other letters to fit. And if you are looking at a schematic, if you did quickly recopy it, where now that KJH branch is sticking out from L, you're going to see that H clearly comes after L since H follows K, K is following L. So H is going to have to come later than L. That means answer choice C, H is earlier than L. That's impossible, right? We see that J and G, they're still on separate tracks. K, J, H come after L, but that's separate branch from G following L. So you might feel good based on that, that D is correct. Otherwise, once again, if K comes after L and uh, J comes after K, then by extension, J will have to come after L. So answer choice C, which says J is earlier than L, also impossible. And answer choice D, they're expecting us to see, is the one that scores us the point. That is the correct answer. And it always, it just feels good always to see that 100%. We nailed it. Uh, so once again, as I redo my uh, screens here, uh, feel free to jump in with any questions. Oh, my face is back over here. Okay. Um, if... No pressing concerns, either, again, everybody's super on board or everybody's asleep. Um, you know, both of those are going to have to work for now. But one more time, let me just touch on what we've sort of learned here. Hello. Oh, my.
Zoom is fun. Everybody loves Zoom. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what? Uh, and yes, uh, Russell, you're you're good. Good. You're calling me out here. So my goal with the with the class for sure is to make sure that we are getting to the things that I know you will see and that I know will be worth points. That's what's most important for me to highlight in our time together. So I think Russell, you're asking about the rule of substitution question. So yes, I cheated. I made it so that that rule of substitution question wouldn't show up in the little uh, quiz I created for us in Magoosh. And that's for a very good reason. It's that th there is a way to get into advice I can give you on rule of substitution questions, but let's be clear, not th there's never more than one in a section, right? You're only gonna see one rule of substitution question in a section, again, historically, officially that could change in future LSATs. But over the years I've been doing it, there's never more than one out of 23 questions that's a rule of substitution question. And there isn't always even that one. So there's a very little impact on your score. And the second thing is they're hard. They're legitimately tricky. There isn't as perfect a tip I can give you for how to handle that. What I will quickly say, and thanks for letting me off the hook, but what I will quickly say for anyone else who is thinking about rule of substitution is the first thing you're doing is eliminating any answers that aren't shown in all your options, right? It's gotta be that the new rule is a perfect substitute. So if it changes your options at all, you know you can eliminate an answer. So that's the first thing you're gonna do, knock out answers that aren't shown in all of your options. Very often though, that's gonna leave you with two or three answers still. And this is where it gets tricky because you need to find the one that, uh, the, the answer choice, if you can break that rule following the original a set of options, then you can also eliminate it. So it's sort of a two-way street, right? Something that wouldn't have been allowed by the new rule and something that still isn't, a, uh, something that wouldn't have been allowed, I should say, by the original rule and something that still isn't allowed by the new rule. And I've spent many hours in tutoring sessions looking over people's shoulders, seeing how confusing that gets. I myself, if I'm going to miss one on a logic game section, it's very often the rule substitution question where I end up kind of having to go on a hunch. So it's a little less of a slam dunk, doesn't impact your score as much. So for tonight, we skipped it, at least not counting the little bit of help I just uh, tried to offer there. But I really wouldn't worry about it too much. If you're consistently getting like 20, 21, 22 out of 23 correct, that's when you can spend a little bit more time trying to plow into rule substitution. Otherwise, eliminate the ones that don't match your options and do your use your best judgment to guess from what's left. Don't invest too much time in that one. Um, yeah, sorry, Maddie. I know we move pretty quickly in class, so I absolutely I apologize. And I know if perhaps that leaves you not even sure what you want to ask. I, I totally get that. So I try to give it a little bit of air for you to form questions if you have them. Um, otherwise, we do tend to have a slightly quicker pace in class uh, to make sure that we can get to just everything that I'm, I'm hoping to share. And if you don't get it all on the first pass, that's a big reason why I wanna make sure you have the slides and the recording so you can come back through and revisit some of these details on your own time. But thanks for calling that out. I'll try to be a little bit more uh, mindful of it as we move forward. All right, so what did we learn um, from this second game? So if we see that we have the sequencing rules like we just had, the rules are all about what goes before and after what, then to find our inferences, we took two really important steps that you're gonna wanna reconstruct each time you're in a similar situation. First, we combined rules together by rewriting the rules, but we only wrote each letter once. And that's what gave us that schematic, as I keep calling it with the branches in the box, that basically combined the rules together and made inferences for us, all right? Showed those extra relationships. The second thing we did was we went through one by one and we crossed off the spaces where each letter couldn't go. So now this could be worth repeating to yourself a few times because I know it's a mouthful the first time that the number of letters that has to come after is always equal to the number of spaces at the end that you can cross off. That's where the letter won't fit. And by the same token, the number of letters that must come before is equal to the number of spaces at the beginning 
where that letter will not fit. Okay, so a little bit of staring at these bullet points or repeating that to yourself. But I promise I've seen people who thought they were hopeless turn into real masters of this with a little bit of practice that turns into definitely less than 60, maybe even only about 40 or so seconds of work to get all those cross outs the way we had it shown earlier. And that final takeaway, you wanna get a good feeling for when you've been able to add a lot of information to your master diagram, which might signal to you that you don't need to spend the extra time to draw out limited options. You've already got all the inferences the test expects you to make that are gonna be worth all of the points. All right, if there are no other questions coming up for now, let's dive into round three. And we're gonna move away from the uh, sequencing for now and get into uh, what usually happens, actually pretty much like 99% of the time, what almost always happens if you're not sequencing is you are grouping. And I think we looked at uh, this one when we were doing our example of the first couple steps last week as well. And since everybody worked on this one for homework this week, Hopefully the first couple parts of this will come fairly naturally. As it says, take a deep breath, here we go. Five artifacts, and I'm still uh, rewriting the list, uh, partly just because doing it the same way every single time is what gives you a lot of confidence. V, W, X, Y, and Z are recovered from a sunken ship and are each known to have originated in I, N, or S, uh, and then it introduces the rules. So with no other info, a really short first paragraph like that, what they're expecting us to recognize is we're gonna take V, W, X, Y, Z and assign them to one of I, N, or S. In other words, those become the labels. And I'm gonna do this as rows, okay? One more reminder, uh, when we're sequencing, pretty much everybody makes rows. But on games like this, the grouping games especially, is where people, some people will do it horizontally, meaning I made rows here. Some people are going to do it vertically, meaning I, N, and S become columns. So you should do it ultimately the way that is easiest for you to interpret info, the way that it makes the most sense to you, so that your notes are the most helpful visual aid. But don't let any instructor tell you different. There is no material difference between doing this horizontally or doing it vertically. They both would work perfectly, okay? For our purposes in class tonight, I'm gonna make these are I, N, and S rows. And now something really important to bring up that I do think I hit on last week, but it's worth repeating. I'm considering the empty spaces here. We know that's part of the master diagram, but notice I only made labels. I didn't add spaces because this first paragraph didn't tell me where the spaces go. So most often you should expect to see that there's one, it's gonna say exactly one goes to each or exactly two goes to each or very common historically on the grouping games it is it would say at least one goes to each and I would put one space in next to each of I, N or S. But in this game, they didn't say any of that info, which means they're expecting us to recognize that there might not be any that go to a certain row. A row might be left empty. So one more time, the master diagram wants to be a perfect representation of the logic that's in the setup of the game here and in the rules. So if they're not telling me there has to be a space in I, N, or S, I'm not writing in any spaces yet. Again, as a visual reminder to myself, that a row might be left empty. I will add those dashes in as I figure out where I know for sure they go. What that means is these games that uh, sometimes get called floating games or flexible games, to, depending on whom you are uh, talking to or whose book you're reading or video you're watching. Um, that means we gotta be thinking about the numbers as we go along. So the good news is there's only five letters but we're gonna to need to keep track of how many dashes we've filled in, how many more are left to get to all five to make sure that we are seeing additional inferences. Cause in games like this, a lot of the powerful inferences are gonna to relate to the numbers. And we're gonna see that even more powerfully in just a second here. For now, we, we at least thought about blank spaces. We have labels, we have the list of letters, good master diagram, we're ready for the rules. 
Rule number one says W and Y originate in the same country. So to us, that means they go together. So that should raise a, a big red flag, not a red flag, but that should be a strong signal to you. Again, common patterns that lead to inferences. Almost any game where letters have to go together, that's where your limited options are gonna come from. So we love seeing this. We already have a clue as to how we will solve this game out. Rule number two says X goes to either N or S. Since that's only two options, that means I can show that pretty easily in my master diagram. And the way Elliot is gonna do that at least is this. So here's X might go to N and here's X might go to S. And because I've shown this in the master diagram, I'm gonna do my thing and I hope it'll be your thing too of a check mark there in the list of rules. One more thing to say about this, because I'm not sure parentheses have come up at all for this group yet. You might see some instructors doing this. It's a very common convention in LSAT world, though. Those parentheses mean it's a conditional space. Okay, so really good symbol to know. In other words, I'm still not sure that there's going to be that space in N or that space in X, uh, that space in S. X is going to go to one of those two rows, but that space otherwise might not be there. So if I want to show a possibility, but I'm not sure if a space is there yet or not, we're going to show that space in parentheses. It's maybe there's a space there and maybe there isn't. So I'm using the parentheses to capture that. Otherwise, again, just an empty space to me means something has to end up being assigned there. So to trust my work later, those parentheses, very, very useful. If we go to number three, here come the numbers again. You, you can see how much they love the math. It says more of the artifacts originated in I than in N. When we get these kind of quantitative rules, which come up often enough to be worth thinking about, but aren't in a lot of games, a lot of people are just gonna use some math symbology. So they're gonna do something like N, uh, I greater than N there for rule number three. And that's the fine way to do it. Uh, but there's a couple of extra things we want to think about, especially, again, since there's only five total spaces, there's not that many ways for I to have more than N. So again, we're going to be lawyers and think a little bit about the, the limitations here. The first thing it should mean to everybody, everybody should be on board with, we are now ready to put a dash in the I row. There's going to have to be a letter at I, can't be empty. Otherwise, we're going to break that I greater than N rule. I'm also gonna show a little conditionality by saying, okay, so if there is a space, if I do add that space to N, I know I'm gonna have to add a space to I. Okay, so I could almost check this off. It's where a little bit of artwork or personal preference comes in, but throwing that arrow, which we know means conditionality into the uh, diagram is a really good way to represent more about this rule that every time I add a space to N, that means I'm gonna to have to add another to I to make sure it has more, okay? If everybody's on board there, then speaking of conditionality, here's our first conditional rule. And we know uh, from last week, this is where that arrow symbol really comes in handy. So we see if V originated in I, then Z originated in S. So back to put it in our master diagram terms, we're saying if I goes to, excuse me, other way around, if V goes to the I row. So for me, that would look like this. There's the I row with V on a space next to it. So I want to make that condition look like it will in my master diagram. And I'm going to use the arrow to show the if then relationship. If V goes to the I row, then Z goes to the S row, okay? So you can do it just like me. If your art's a little bit different, that's okay. As long as you definitely use that arrow symbol and you're gonna be sure what this means for the next five minutes or so. Now, intermediate to advanced, but I still recommend this for everybody. And if you're still new to the LSAT, uh, this may take a little bit more practice, but we gotta know, the LSAT certainly expects you to know, Every conditional rule uh, can be triggered two different ways. Basically, the logic here is if you don't have the effect, 
then you must not have had the cause, all right? So in other words, here we can say, if we don't have the effect, in other words, if Z does not go to S, then we must not have had the cause. We didn't have the trigger. In other words, that means V must not have gone to I, okay? So logically, that's a good way to remember it. If you didn't have the effect, you must not have had the cause. And you can use that to draw out this second version of the rule. Otherwise, when you're on the clock, the quick way to remember how to do this accurately is that we reverse and negate, okay? Reverse and negate, reverse and negate. In other words, what was on the left side of the arrow is now on the right side and vice versa. We reversed the left and right and we negated them. What was positive before, V goes to I, Z goes to S, is now negative. If, v does, if Z does not go to S, then V does not go to I. Okay, so if you reverse and negate, you will properly capture that second version of most conditional rules, which to make sure this lines up with logic, if you're studying formal logic lessons later, we refer to this as the contrapositive, uh, but no worries, that vocabulary doesn't actually show up on the LSAT. You don't actually have to know that word. That's just how you're gonna hear other LSAT instructors refer to this second trigger, this second version of each conditional rule, okay? But since triggers are really important to us, we want to have both versions in front of us. That could be helpful to you as you're going through the game, just in case there's a question later that says like, if Z goes to N, that'll trigger for us. Oh, if Z goes to N, that means Z doesn't go to S. So that means V cannot go to I. Is that second version may come up when you're working on the questions. All right, now what's really, really valuable to us to come back to the main takeaway, the main reason we're looking at this game, partly to get a little practice grouping instead of sequencing, but mostly so we can see how powerful the inference is around uh, the pairs of letters that have to go together. So without thinking about it too hard, by the time you arrive at test day, if you see a game like this, you're saying to yourself, there's only three rows, so that means there are definitely only three options for how to put W and Y together. And that's what's gonna lead to my three uh, options. So again, we make the extra copies of the master diagram, no parentheses and slashes and stuff. We're gonna wait and see if some of that gets forced into place. I'm only writing what I know for sure. And the only thing I know for sure is there has to be a letter at I. Okay, so that's why it looks like that for now. And now we'll map out our three options where this pair can go together. So W and Y could go together in the I row. W and Y could go together in the N row. W and Y could go together in the S row. So we again, add those options in. In this case, the options for the pair. And again, with only five letters, this is really great because we have two of the five already filled in. That means even if you didn't spend extra time making inferences and went right to the questions now, this is already a useful template because two of the five letters are already filled in. But of course, we are gonna want to recheck our leftover rules just like we did before. And now conditionality can be tricky. If the conditional rule gets triggered, like if V ends up at I or Z ends up away from S, then we'll add a little more. But until one of those things happen, it's kind of like the rule isn't there. If the condition doesn't happen, then the rule is not in force. What should be really important to us, again, as I was pointing out at the top, is the numbers. So especially because, as our master diagram reminds us, if we add to the N row, we got to add to the I row to make sure it has more. So let's look at that lower option there where W and Y went to N. We've now got two letters going to the N row. That means there have to be three letters in the I row to make sure we're following that I has more than N rule. Now there's only five letters in this game. So that puts everything else. That means it's V, it's X, and it's Z would all need to go into the I row, row in this case. And if you didn't catch it before now, that's fine. Write it in until you see it in front of your face. That's the whole point here. So prove stuff to ourselves with awesome note taking. But we can now see, wait, the master diagram says X has to go to N or S. We're also now breaking the conditional rule. But one way or the other, here comes the super powerful inference for this game. 
we're not allowed. WNY won't fit in the end row because we end up breaking these other rules. All right, hopefully everybody agrees. If you make a good powerful inference like that, that gets you from three options down to two, it's gonna happen a lot. Again, this is another exit off of our make uh, inferences highway here. You could say, I'm now ready to go to the questions. There will probably be points that rely just on knowing that W and Y can't go to N and I can make extra copies if I need. Otherwise, there could be some more inferences that you'd add on here. Um, but what I'll do is give everybody like an extra minute here with the questions in case you do want to practice spelling out a little bit more. Uh, or in the case that we might need to make one or two extra examples uh, to make sure that we're seeing the inferences. But one more time, let me drop the link in for the questions. And one more time, just about five minutes that we'll take to see if with this powerful inference, if you made this inference and knocked this one out, that's cool, just hang out. Uh, and then we will come back and work through the answers in just about five minutes.
Right, about another 30 seconds or as long as it'll take me to get the screen switched around again. All right, folks, I know there were six questions with this one, but also so I can try to have us finish not more than a minute or two late here, uh, we'll go ahead and start walking through. And then um, I'm sure everybody wants to get on with their day or their evening, but I am happy to hang out an extra minute or two if there are some pressing questions, if you do need a little bit more feedback to feel good about what we went over tonight before we wrap up. Otherwise, um, let's take a look. Now, this first question um, is really worth touching on because what we have here, which of the following could be an accurate matching, is our first like complete arrangement question. So perhaps you've noticed, if you haven't, mo the most common first question with a game, it's not every game, is the one where the answers are just a, a full arrangement of the list, but only one of them doesn't break any rules. So you may have already picked up on this, but let's demonstrate that the best way to handle this kind of question is actually usually not with the options. If you have a really good diagram with really great options, that will work brilliantly too. But otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to go one by one, not through the answers, but one by one through the rules. Okay, it goes way faster this way to say we're going to take the first rule, check all the answers and see where we should expect one of the answers breaks that rule. And so we have four rules. We're going to eliminate an answer each time and we'll be left only with the correct answer. So for instance, the first rule that says W and Y originated in the same country, we can see actually right away in answer choice A there, we see that W and Y are split up. And that tells me we can eliminate that one. You should expect that there's only going to be one you can eliminate for each rule. But if we scan quickly through the rest, we'll see that W and Y are together in each one. The next rule, X goes to either N or S. But uh, down here in answer choice E, X went to the I row. So it breaks that rule. We can eliminate that one. The third rule is the more have to go to I than N rule. And let's remember part of the reason it's nice that on test day, they let you cross this stuff out. A and E are already gone. We don't have to look again. But in uh, B and in D, that's OK. But in C, they both got two letters. So that breaks that third rule. We can eliminate that one. And finally, the conditional rule, if V goes to I, we can see in answer choice A, V didn't go to I, excuse me, in answer choice B, I should say, that V didn't go to I. So again, if the condition doesn't happen, then it's like that rule is not there. But down here in answer choice D, V does go to the I row, which means Z is supposed to be in the S row, but it's not. That breaks that conditional rule. So answer choice D is also incorrect. And we can pick answer choice B uh, to get the point here. All right, if we go to number two, number two says if Y and Z go to I, what's the minimum number that have to go to S? So you, you can see again, when they don't give you specific information about the numbers that the numbers keep coming up, this becomes important to them. Um, so a little bit of uh, quant thinking is good, even if you're never actually making calculations on the LSAT. Uh, good for us. Uh, who wants it? Who wants it? Okay. Uh, you should also see this relies directly on our options, right? If Y goes to I, that tells us we're looking only at the option where, of course, W has to go with Y. So we know W, Y, and now Z all go to the I row, okay? Now, that does not trigger our condition. We don't have V going to I, which would force Z to go to S. So you should be able to, and, and sketch it out if you need, to see that the other two, X is allowed to go to N, and V could also go to N. In other words, if Y and Z go to I, I can leave the S row empty. So a little bit annoying, but answer choice A, if Y and Z go to I, the minimum number that goes to S is zero. Answer choice A is correct.
All right, let's go to number three. No additional condition here, just which of the following cannot be true. Now it's easy to start tying yourself in knots saying, I need to make an extra copy and show for answer choice A, V and X going to N and for answer choice B, V and Y going to I, right? On a game where we didn't have the options as spelled out. But this is where one more time, how, how much can I hammer you that the one or two key inferences you make are gonna lead directly to points. So what did we determine up front? The one big inference we made was W and Y can't go to the N row. They won't fit there. Turns out, ding, 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 that's on this list of answers. Which of the following cannot be true? W and Y cannot go to the N row. Answer choice E is correct here. All right, let's go to number four. And again, W and Y get implicated in our extra condition here. So if W and X go to S, then we know that means that brings Y along with it. So we now have W, X, and Y all going to the S row, all right? So the inference to make there comes back to the numbers. If we now have three in the S row, there are only two letters left, right? I am not allowed to split those letters, one in the I row, one in the N row, because that would break the I has to have more than N rule. In other words, if we now have three letters in the S row, which this question is for forcing us to have, we're gonna have to leave N empty and put the other two letters into the uh, I row to avoid breaking the I is greater than N rule. So if W and X go to S, then the N row is empty or in the language of the test, none of the artifacts originated in N. Answer choice A is correct here. With that point scored, let's go to number five, which I think is the one that historically gets the most people confused on this game uh, because it's almost a little unfair. There's a couple ways you could interpret what this question means. When it says exactly how many of the artifacts are there, any one of which could have originated in Norway. I've known many bright young future lawyers who interpreted this question to mean how many letters can be in the N row at one time, right? Unfortunately, and that, that might lead you to think that the answer is two because that's the only way to make sure that there's more letters left to go in the I row. So if you picked answer choice B, I can't fault you, but the LSAT will. That is not the correct answer because this is not the right way to interpret the question. So when you see this, any one of which could have, if you see that kind of language again, what they mean is across all of the allowable arrangements of the game, how many of the letters ever end up in the end row, even if it's not at the same time? Okay, that's what this question wants to mean. And this is one more chance for me to highlight our one big inference scores us the point here, because what we learned from drawing out options was W and Y cannot go to the end row but there was no reason why the other three letters couldn't. There's some scenario where each of X, W, and excuse me, uh, V, X, and Z go to the N row. So they are expecting us to interpret the question that way. No W and Y to N, but the other three are okay. Answer choice C is correct. And now our last question uh, for tonight here. And this is the one time uh, that I think it is gonna be best to demonstrate, even if you make a lot of really terrific inferences, you're gonna end up needing to do some extra work at least some of the time. So we will finish up here uh, by eliminating these other choices. Uh, in order to see what's left, because we're really not looking at a lot of good uh, choices here. 
So which of the following cannot be true? What we're going to do is make sure that we have a copy of the diagram that shows each of these answers or that shows as many as we need to. And once we show that it does work, we will know that that is not the right answer, right? Cannot be true means it's impossible. So we're going to show that each answer is possible and that's what will allow us to eliminate it. If we're really unable to fill one out showing one of these answers, that'll tell us this is the correct answer, okay? So uh, answer choice A said that only V goes to S. So we know that if only V goes to S, and on the last question, you can start messing up your options. If only V goes to S, uh, that would mean that we're in the scenario where W and Y go to I. And if only V is going to go to S, that means that uh, the others are going to have to go elsewhere. So we know that X is not allowed in the IRO. So I'm going to have to put X on N if it's not allowed to go to S. And now Z to make sure that I has more than N and that V is by itself at S. I'm gonna put Z up at the I row. Here is only V goes to S. It follows all the rules. That's what tells you you can eliminate answer choice A here, okay? Now I can sort of reuse this same one. Answer choice B says only V and Z go to S. So I'm just gonna quickly cross out that I ever put Z up here drop Z down into the S row. And now once again, here's only V and Z go to S. We still have more at I than an N, so we're still following all the rules so we can eliminate answer choice B. Again, that is possible. So it is not the right answer to a cannot be true question. Only W and Y originate in S. So now we'll go to our other option where W and Y are in S. And now, I know I'm going to trigger the conditional rule. If I put V up at I, that is going to force me to put Z at S, right? That's the condition. So I've got to keep V out of the I row so that I don't trigger the condition because I want the answer says only W and Y at S. I don't want to add Z. So that means I have to put V in the N row. And like this whole question, if we're not going to have X at S, then we have to have X at N, our master diagram tells us. And I now see that I've used four of the five, right? So I only have one letter left, which means that I'm now breaking I has more than N, right? I put two letters in N. I would technically, I would need to have three letters at I, but that's not allowed uh, here because I don't have seven letters. That's too many spaces. Now, if you trust this, if you're following that logic and you trust this, this does tell you that C is the correct answer. Otherwise, we can uh, quickly sketch out and prove to ourselves that the other two are also possible, and that means we can eliminate them. So answer choice D says only X and Z originated at S, which means, of course, that we're back at option number one, where W and Y would have to go to I. And in this case, V is the only letter left. So Z is already at S. That means that the second part of our condition is already happening. So I could actually, I could put V up here if I wanted and be following the rules. I could put V at N and that would be following the rules. But one way or the other, only Z at X, only Z and X going to the S row, this is possible. So again, we can eliminate it on a cannot be true question. And now the last answer, answer choice E, whew, says V, W, X, and Y all go. So that would be like back up here if I take X out of the N row. Oh, no, I'm just going to make a new one. Sorry, I'm making a mess here. Let's come on over here. And we now need all four, V, W, X, and Y all go to S. We know from the master diagram, something has to be up at I, which in this case, that's Z is the only letter we haven't used, but this follows all the rules. The condition is not triggered. I has more than N, W and Y are still together. So answer choice E, again, it is possible. Therefore, it is not the right answer. Answer choice C is the one we wanted to pick on number six.
We made it. Um, so again, I know we're a few minutes over. So if you need to jump off, that's totally cool. But I'm going to give it just another minute here. Uh, first to quickly just recap the big takeaways. And then if anyone does have questions that they would still like to ask tonight about anything we went over or anything Magush or LSAT related, I'm more than happy to hang out another few minutes uh, for Q&A. Okay, but what were the big, big takeaways here tonight? Uh, we know, again, we've seen now the most common patterns, you're gonna see them again and again and again, folks. So you gotta recognize when you're in a situation where a letter can only go in two spaces or sometimes where a space can only have two letters. But when we get down to these 50-50s, only two options left, great way to draw out limited options. We've seen that when they give us pairs of letters that have to go together, that should pretty much always be the way you're going to map out the options in that game. Failing these two things, you're going to want to make sure that uh, the rules reuse the same letter, right? You're looking for what's most impacted or most restricted. Um, and let me pause there. Yeah, Sherry is asking about the handout, which I almost forgot. I did already link it. So from now on, I know I didn't do this this week. But from now on, after class, you'll be able to just go back to the classes tab and you'll see that you've got the link to the handout. In the meantime, for now, there you go uh, with the link back to the slides and uh, the uh, homework, some homework instructions for next week when we'll get into logical reasoning. Um, Want to make sure that you've got this process for drawing out the options. So you identify what you want your limited options to be. You sketch out extra copies of the diagram showing those options only. Then you're rechecking the leftover rules to add in the additional inferences. Hopefully you'll have many logic games that go like the first one we did tonight where we had basically a complete solution in front of us when we started working on the questions. And then just remember, if you're able to add a lot of info to your master diagram, maybe you can move to the questions without drawing out the limited options. But if you move on to the questions without having a lot of extra info in your master diagram or without drawing out those limited options, you're in for a lot more work. So just remember to use the process of elimination as your best friend when you're working on these games. So one more time, uh, I'm going to give it just a little bit of air in case there are questions that you'd like to get answered right away. Otherwise, I really hope this uh, session was helpful for everybody tonight. And I will see you again. The We'll have the recording link up, hopefully within about 24 hours, definitely sooner than we did this week. Sorry about the, the lag there this time. The link for the handout is already there and just shared in the chat. But if you need to revisit it later, click on the classes tab to find that. Email us at help at magoosh.com if any other concerns come up later. And I will see you all next Tuesday for some just super fun logical reasoning. I'm sure no one can wait for that. Uh, and in the meantime, yeah, you're all just so welcome. I'm, I'm really glad if this is helping and have a great night. I'll see y'all next week, uh, but I will. I'm going to give it yeah, just a few more seconds, long, awkward pause in case anyone wants to ask other questions. Are there specific tests I recommend practicing? So I think, Kaylee, you mean like specific prep test numbers, um, in which case, the general guidance is, I mean, the, the LSAT has changed very little over the last bunch of years. So in general, you want to go for the higher numbers, the more recent tests, because those are a little more indicative of recent tr trends. So you see, I'm using leaning heavily on the early 70s, because those are still recent enough to be useful, but not recent enough that you want to keep them for your full length mock tests. Anything before like the 60s, definitely anything before prep test 52, you really shouldn't need unless you're, you're a long-term LSATer and you end up needing more than 40 prep tests, which you really shouldn't need because it's where there are just, just enough differences that those aren't quite as useful, but they still are. Otherwise, no. Um, every logic game section is going to have sequencing games. So you're getting a chance to practice most of the patterns we saw tonight, no matter what. And you want some wild cards. You want to be in that situation where you have to unpack things or it's not quite as familiar because that's really what's getting you ready for a situation you might face on test day the best. So no, not specific numbers that I recommend. Just in general, stick to the more recent ones if you can and try not to go back further than you know the 50s or 60s if you don't need them. Good question though.
And another nice long, awkward pause. I'm just going to sit for a sec in case anyone else is left who would like to uh, fire any other questions away. No problem. I hope that helps. All right, stragglers, looks like that's it. If no one else has other questions, uh, have, a, have a lovely evening and I will see you next week. Happy studying.